Hi, Charlie Sykes here. There's really never been a better time to help support the mission of The Bulwark to bring sanity and a non-tribal lens to our national politics. Now, we're not shy about defending democracy and calling out bad actors, and we're building a community for people who value good faith debate and are not necessarily looking for a safe space. So for a short time, we have a special offer for you. Upgrade today to a Bulwark Plus membership and get the next two weeks on us for free. You can cancel any time. That'll give you access to all of our newsletters, including my morning shots and JVL's Triad, as well as all of our other podcasts, including Sarah Longwell's Focus Group, Mona Charon's Beg to Differ, and The Next Level. If you haven't joined us yet, I hope you'll consider it. Thanks. Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. It is Wednesday. And once again, stop me if you've heard me say this before. I feel like I've taken crazy pills. So uh, as an antidote to all of that, we are joined once again by our good friend Tom Nichols, staff writer at The Atlantic and professor emeritus at the Naval War College. Tom, welcome back onto the podcast. Thanks, Charlie. Well, where do we start today? I, I really want to talk about what's going on in Russia uh, the clock ticking in Russia, uh, Vladimir Putin's various meltdowns. You and I were talking about this right before we started. I, I, I find myself going back and forth between saying to people, hey, guys, could you just dial it down a little bit? Just calm down, have a sense of humor on the one hand. And then also looking at it around and going, hey, well, you people, wh why do you not have your hair on 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 fire? And this would be my reaction, you know, on, in the same day, different hours. But it does feel like we just toggle between these two extremes, right? It's either, OK, this is just too ridiculous. I have to back off versus, hey, uh, guys, there's a big fucking meteor headed right toward your head. Why are you not more upset? And you're not going to solve it with a meteor meme. No, or a, or a tweet. I think the thread that underlines that, because I've had the same feeling you do, Charlie, I think, uh, you know, and this is going to sound like another edition of grumpy old men here on, on the bulwark, but it's what we um, do, our brand, <laughs> <it's>, uh, <laughs> ah, you know, these kids today, <laughs> but, but I think, um, the thread for me that underlines it is something I've written about before, which is seriousness. You know, it's, it's a, you should have your hair on fire about, the decline and potential, you know, overthrow of the Constitution of the United States. That's a big goddamn deal. It's On concerning. the other hand, you know, calling yourself the resistance, you know, like you're all wearing berets and skulking through the forests of France in 1944 is just silly. And so there's a there's this kind of tacking back and forth between, you know, law, nothing matters and uh, look at this funny meme I made with a dog and, you know, people uh, saying, oh, my God, you know, uh, this is everything is fascism and Nazis all the way down. There is no adult response to this, which is, yes, this is I, I might be one of the few people that like the like President Biden saying semi fascism. Right? I think of it as incipient fascism or, you know, kind of minor league fascism compared to the 1930s. But it's it's fascism nonetheless, and at least in terms of its its content. By the way, and I, I, I'm just free associating for a moment, I was going back through something the other day and, you know, oh, you guys have never used the word fascist. You know, you should have used the word fascist. I was looking up Charles Krauthammer's old uh, piece about Pat Buchanan 30 years ago, and there it is. Krauthammer called Buchanan a fascist. So, you know, there there were conservatives who were ahead of that curve. Boy, but I miss Charles Krauthammer, yeah. Yeah, well, don't we all? But I do think that that's the that's the thread that underlines all this of saying, look, there's a you know, uh, these are adult reactions you need to have, which is con to be concerned, to be resolute, to want to do something about it, but um, you know, you're not solving it by wearing you know stickers that say, uh, you know, vive la resistance and law, nothing matters. I mean, it's there's got to be something in between there. Well, and I did my newsletter today about the the, the right's lust for violence, uh, sort of just playing off of this new Roger Stone video. And again, Roger Stone is, is one of these perfect examples where he's a complete clown, but he's a clown with a flamethrower, nevertheless. Right. And, you know, he's talking about, you know, we need to go out there and kill people and shoot people, shoot to kill Antifa, you know, fuck the election. Let's go right to the violence, et cetera. And of course, Roger Stone is, is a clown, except that, OK, people, um, you know, this is not just theoretical out there. 
you have the January 6th rioters. I didn't include this, but, you know, CBS has a big story about a a survey. More than 18 months after the rioting at the U.S. Capitol by a pro-Trump mob, an estimated, listen to this, 13 million U.S. adults, or 5% of the adult population, agree that force would be justified to restore former President Donald Trump to the White House. And an estimated 15 million Americans believe force would be justified to prevent Trump from being prosecuted if he is indicted for mishandling classified documents or anything else. This is a study from the University of Chicago. Dr. Robert Pape, who's the director of uh, UC's Chicago Project on Security and Threats, said, we don't just have a political threat to our democracy, we have a violent threat to our democracy. And so like people... You know, th- this is this is no joke here. Uh, you you have yeah. American greatness, which is sort of the the intellectual home of these super maga types like Victor Davis Hanson, and and they're running this new piece by Michael Anton. Remember Michael Anton? You know, the Flight ninety three election guy from two thousand sixteen. Oh, yes. And I don't know how you read it as anything other than a justification slash call for violent revolution. And you're looking around going, okay, people, we are in a combustible period here. This is, you know, we're not dealing with a world in in, in which the worst crisis we face is high gas prices, I guess is what I'm saying. Not to minimize that. It's astounding because, you know, this is not the Great Depression. This is not World War II. This is not some, you know, systemic crisis. And yet these clowns writing articles about violent revolution, for them, it's a game. For them, it's, you know, I was this close to being... Um, one of the elite to being, you know, part of the um, the governing crowd. I mean, these are people who hate elites because they're not in them, and they they don't. It's not they don't want to have elites. They just want to be the elite and displace others that they don't like. And so they kind of write these idiotic pieces because for them it's just a game. Let's see who wins. Let's see what happens in the next election. Let's keep throwing dice. You know, you'll notice that Roger Stone, you know, makes sure that he's not actually in the middle of the fight. And the rest of these people won't be either. They are riling up other people to send them in to hurt other Americans and then end up in jail for, you know, six or seven. One of the one of the um, January 6th guys just got almost something like seven years yesterday. You know, hope an afternoon of violent political tourism was worth seven years in jail. And this guy was was one of the guys who is part of that he mob. He brought attack his son. On, he brought his son there and they, they were playing with tasers and things like that. And. Look, why was he there? He was there because he was ginned up by all this rhetoric from people saying, you know, real patriots need to fight back against the regime. This is 1776. So here's the thing is you keep throwing those memes around and people will believe them and they will act on them. So not to trivialize this, but I find myself in order to maintain my sanity thinking that um, one of the most important political documentaries of our time is not. Well, there's there's two. There's Idiocracy, right? But there's also Zoolander. (laughs) Um, because so, so many of the politicians sound like they're Zoolander. I mean, Elise Stefanik sounds like she's a character from Zoolander lately. I mean, that gives you. But also, remember the classic scene, and people need to go and find this, the Zoolander gas fight, where they all go and it's all fun and games at the gas station, and they're playing with the gas <laughs> thing, and they're, you know, spraying each other with gasoline. Like, what could go wrong? This is so cool. And, of course, it ends precisely the way you'd expect it to end. <laughs> I feel like America is like we are in the Zoolander gas fight scene. When we're talking about the um, the writer who just got that long sentence, you know, who brought his son, you know, there is this weird thing of why am I going to this? Well, because it's 1776 and, you know, re- revolution. But also, this is going to be cool. Yeah. I'm bringing my son mm-hmm. and we're going to wear, you know, cool costumes and capes and it's going to be a hell of an afternoon. We have their Instagram and their texts and and their videos of, hey, I just did this really fun thing. And now I'm going to go back to Texas and sell sell real estate. Well, it doesn't work that way. Um, But it tells you about the kind of fundamental, fundamentally shallow um, approach that these people take to politics that's been encouraged by, again, this kind of chorus of you know, the wannabe clowns who are like, you know, but for the Constitution, I would have been Secretary of State. You know? <laughs> and um, they rile up people and, and suddenly the fun turns into Michael Fanon begging for his life and, and pleading that he has children. And then, you know, seven months later, standing in front of a, a magistrate and 
realizing that your life's over, that your life's been completely destroyed. And why? Because you watch too much fucking TV. Yeah. And at, months after this, rather than this sobering us all up, uh, things have gotten worse. So you, you were mentioning the adults. Who are the adults? Where are the adults? Uh, um, yesterday, the, the judge in that case, uh, Judge Amy Berman Jackson, was very much an adult. And uh, she said- Very much so, yes. I, I just want to read what she said, because this, is, this, was, this was clear. This was clarion. She said, the judiciary, if nobody else- has to make it clear it is not it was not patriotism it it is not standing up for america to stand up for one man who knows full well that he lost instead of the constitution he was trying to subvert some prominent figures in the republican party are cagely predicting or even outright calling for violence in the streets if one of the multiple investigations doesn't go his way judge jackson said and then she says to the to the rioter you were not prosecuted for being a Trump supporter. You were not arrested or charged, and you will not be sentenced for exercising your First Amendment rights. You are not a political prisoner. You are trying to stop the singular thing that makes America, America, the peaceful transfer of power. That's what stop the steal means. Wow. Yeah, it was incredible. And with no clever circumlocutions here, I mean, she just went right at it. And I think, you know, especially having to put a guy away for for seven years, um, he needed to know why he's going. And to his, I guess, small credit, I mean, he said, I guess I deserve whatever I'm about to get. But that's what happens when the spell is broken. But you look at the tape of January 6th and, you know, even as it turns into violence, these people all think they're at a party. They all think, you know, Mm -hmm. that they're at like, you know, Woodstock with bear spray. And this is, again, I'll just keep hammering on this point I've been making for a long time. These are people who are looking for some kind of meaning in their lives and right-wing pundits who know better, who, and they know better. I mean, Michael Anton knows better. Tucker Carlson, I don't know. Tucker Carlson is just such an empty husk at this point. Who knows? But most of these people know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly the risks they're telling other people to take, and they don't care. We have to own the libs and win the game. Yeah, And uh, there was actually, since we're talking about good pieces about this, and before we came on, I, I said your morning shots piece this morning was, uh, I thought, great. Thank you. Interesting as well that the artist formerly known as Ala Pundit, mm-hmm. Nick Katojo, um, he had a very good piece where he said- Over at the Dispatch. Yeah, over at the Dispatch. Mm-hmm. He had the only animating notion among the conservatives now is spite. Right. There's no programmatic issue. There's no policy. Bit, and it's nothing. It's just- Whatever you're for, I'm against. Whatever enrages you is what I want because I, there's nothing else. There's no, there's no there there with any of these folks. They don't care about anything. They just care about kind of their own sense of, of inchoate and diffuse grievance about everything. And the only reason we're really even talking about some of this stuff is, is of course, because uh, the former and perhaps future president of the United States keeps stoking it. And, and I think that one of the things that was in uh, Judge Jackson's mind when she was telling uh, this, uh, this rioter, uh, as she was sentencing him to, to prison, was that there is this movement out there that regards uh, the rioters as political prisoners. And, and in an undercover story, and there are very few undercover stories involving Donald Trump, but I think this one was, that he actually called into a January 6th you know, jail rally or something like that to express his solidarity with the people who are uh, still in jail for what they did. And as Amanda Carpenter has documented, and my colleague at the Bulwark, Amanda Carpenter, has documented at you know in, in great detail, Trump has made it very clear that he intends to uh, issue pardons for January sixth rioters uh, who have been oh, yeah. late charge. Now, would that include the guy, the the guys who tased Officer Fanon? Has he made any distinction whatsoever, or are they all sitting there going, not only were we really patriots, not only was this 1776, but we are going to get away with it because when there is the restoration of Trump 2.0, when the military drags you know, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris off to Gitmo and, and executes them and Donald Trump becomes president again, he's going to pardon us. I mean, this is the sickness that unfortunately is shaping some of our, our, our you know, our political environment. And, and as if I could be more uncharitable, I'm going to be even more uncharitable and say, you know, this is not even a political stance. This is a group of people, you know, first of all, who don't have any clue what it means to be a political prisoner. Right. They have no concept of that. And basically it's saying, 
you know, again, if our guy gets in, we win the game. It's like a video game. We get a respawn. We get another life. You know, we get, uh, you know, player one is uh, gets to go back to start and it's a clean slate and we win. There is no sense there at all. You know, when people call themselves, I'm a political prisoner, I'm Martin Luther King. Well, um, none, of, none of you are producing a letter from a Birmingham jail. I'm pretty yeah. sure about that. You're not political prisoners. Yeah, these guys are not Alexander Solzhenitsyn. That's pretty pretty good for a non-Russian speaker. For a non-Russian speaker, as, as by the way, I just uh, documented. So to your point about how on the right, it's all about spite, not policy. I, I guess this this is part of the, that cognitive disconnect when you read something in like the Wall Street Journal editorial page where they're uh, writing about the election in Arizona and in effect endorsing um, conspiracy theorist, election denier, Kerry Lake and saying, what this election is really all about is about school choice. And that moment, Sharon, yeah. in, in the book, <laughs> Moniker is a great piece saying, what planet are you on? Now, I have been a long time enthusiastic supporter of school choice. I remain a supporter of school choice. But I think it is absolutely delusional to think that our politics is about policy issues like this right now when you have the big fucking meteor heading our way. Right. It's it. And when you have someone saying, I will turn 180, you know, turn on a dime, 180 degrees, you know, as uh, so many folks have pointed out. Right. What was Donald Trump's big populist agenda? A classic rich guy, Republican tax cut and a trade war that hurt little guys. And they say, oh, okay, I guess I'm for that. And again, why? Because I have to be for the guy that pisses everybody off. And I've been, I have been—I was thinking about this issue of spite because it, there's still a layer under it of how did we get from 2015 where a lot of, I would say, decent people said, hey, the Democrats and the institutional Republicans, they're not dealing with things like immigration. They're not dealing with, you know, they're not, they don't care enough right. about abortion, whatever it is. <clears throat> okay. But I think where the spike comes from is that all of these folks said, I'm going to take a chance on Donald Trump. And then it turns out that, oh, my God, this was a really bad idea. But I'll double down. And because we're going to get some things. we Oh, man, now I know this is a really, really bad idea. So I'm going to triple down. And of course, by the end of four years, with all of, you know, the annoying people like you and me and, you know, Tim Miller and others standing by saying, we warned you, you've been conned. This was the worst thing that could have happened. You're, this is un-American, anti-constitutional, fascistic, pro-Russian bullshit. The spite now is, I don't care about politics anymore. I have to do something to alleviate the incredible sense of cognitive dissonance and shame and embarrassment that comes from knowing how much I screwed the pooch over the past five years, because there's no, and I said it at the time, there is no climbing down from the tree these people put themselves in. So now they're just going to stand at the top of it and yell, burn it all down. You know, nothing matters. Um, Donald Trump is God because they can't just, there's no way and, and no one did this to them, by the way. It's not like you or I or anybody else didn't give them the space to say it. There's just no way for them to say, wow, I screwed up. This guy's horrible. He's a monster. This is insane. This is why I often think that we ought to spend our time reading uh, more human psychology books rather than political philosophy books. Absolutely. Because, because what you're describing is the, uh, the that that cognitive lock uh, that, that we're seeing. That we, When you've done something truly horrible, then you instead of going, wow, I need to change my, my life. I need to change my direction. No, it's like, I need to double down and find all sorts of ways to transform this into a good life decision. And that will in fact, as you point out, give my life meaning. And to aim my rage and hatred at anyone who calls me out about it. Yeah. Especially the ones who call you, you out at it. I mean, that's why I think they, they reserve their greatest rage, not for Democrats, but for fellow uh, former conservatives or, or current conservatives who say, by the way, you, you've looked at yourself in the mirror lately because that's the real. Well, or to say, we, we warned you and this is not conservatism uh, and this yeah. is not the Republican Party that any of us once knew and that, you know, all of that. And they're like, you know, they can't that that getting even with everyone who was right has become like this project for a, a, a fair number 
uh, of these uh, okay. of MAGA world. I, I want to switch to Russia in a moment, but just on this point, you know, what's going on right now, and, and Trump is certainly very much part of all of this, and, and Michael Anton's piece where he's calling for the violent revolution is, is a more intellectualized version of it. But they're in the process of convincing themselves, sort of ginning themselves up that that uh, to be more courageous, that somehow being more transgressive, more violent, more vulgar, more cruel is a sign of their courage and defining anyone who goes, hey, you know, maybe we ought to be more civil. Maybe we ought to be more prudent. Maybe we ought to uh, have more respect for the law and for Constitution and the truth that these are uh, people who are weak. And so that whole strength and weak thing, and then we're doubling back to, you know, this this is the the fascist id at a certain point, that will to power that if you don't have that will and that courage, then somehow you are the weak sister, you are the weak link, you are the limp dick. And this is the way they're, they're and you can sense that they're, they're working themselves up into, you know, bravery means we go in and we finish the job, right? Right. I hope that anyone listening doesn't think that because I think these people are juvenile and silly that they're also not dangerous. Extreme. Um, you know, Extreme. like, as you yeah. said, you know, clowns with flamethrowers, um, you know, there, there's a, there's a fundamental silliness about somebody like Stuart Rhodes, but that didn't make him less dangerous and the organization he was leading less dangerous. Exactly. Um, but, but there is a juvenile performativeness about this that is yeah. characteristic uh, uh, of fascism. It's, it's, it's Tucker going to the funeral of the Hells Angel leader and posing and, you know, chest, chest out and hanging with the tough guys and yelling into the camera about masculinity and wokeness and, uh, you know, all of that stuff. And I'll only say this is one lesson I learned, you know, maybe sometime in my, probably about the time I went to Washington and I met people who were genuinely powerful and, um, in other areas of my life where I met on occasion, met people who were genuinely dangerous, the most powerful and dangerous people I've ever known never raise their voices. Hmm. They don't have to, they speak quietly. They speak with purpose. They are, they're a lot more dangerous in some ways than the people who get out in the street and start throwing things around. Now, th there's an immediate danger from people like that because they break stuff and they hurt people. But the people with a real sense of purpose who are really, I think, you know, the kind of really dangerous people who are true believers, they tend to be pretty quiet. One of our shared favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, talking about people in, you know, well-lit offices with manicured fingernails, yeah. um, doing terrible things. And so I think there, there is this kind of idiotic adolescence to all of this that nonetheless, and this is where I was going with this, serves the purposes of people who are much more dangerous. That Tucker and the, all these guys in the street, that they're just, they're, they're, they're fodder, they're raw material for people who really do think that the Constitution of the United States should be overthrown. And they are both in this country and overseas. And there is that intersection of, of, of clownishness and, and danger that, that we ought not to, to miss. And I was thinking of one of the great movies of the 20th century, uh, Charlie Chaplin's Great Dictator, where yes. he was mocking Adolf Hitler and Mussolini, not because he thought they were jokes or because he thought they were, uh, you know, simply, you know, fodder for laughter, but, you know, he was pointing out, you know, despite all of their pretensions and their danger that they were clowns, but that they were immensely dangerous. Nevertheless, you know, people, people yeah. who go, you know, you, you and Tom are, are minimizing this. I mean, you're, you're making light of these dangers. Well, Charlie Chaplin did that with the great dictator, because I think there, there is an, a crucial uh, role to be played for the mockery of these pretensions, pointing out that these guys are juvenile performers like Tucker Carlson. And I want to get to Tucker in a moment as well. If we were minimizing it, Charlie, we're we wouldn't not. be talking about it. That's no. how you really minimize it. The fact that we're sitting here having a conversation about it and, and that we're trying to peel apart who, you know, what kind of danger, which groups are, are uh, present which kinds of danger, I think is actually what, you know, where we're trying to be, um, you know, to, to illuminate rather than to minimize. Minimizing would be, let's just talk about, you know, funny stuff we saw on the internet today. That's, that's not what we're doing. 
Okay, here's a segue from the clownishness to the really, really, really grim. Uh, you may have seen this. Uh, Donald Trump is out with a statement on social media offering to uh, mediate peace talks between Russia and Ukraine. I don't know, have, you, have you seen this? Let me just read you. Yes, you hear it? yes. and again, I'm, yeah. la I'm, I'm laughing at, yes. <laughs> in that kind of sad, grim, you know, like, if World War III breaks out and future archaeologists ever piece together what's left of this world, they're going to pick that up and say, really? Did this really happen? U U.S. leadership, okay, in quotation marks, should remain, quote, cool, calm, and dry on the, all in caps, sabotage of the Nord Stream pipelines. This is a big event that should not entail a big solution, at least not yet. Hmm. The Russia-Ukraine catastrophe should never, all in caps, have happened and would definitely not have happened. Notice the passive voice there. No one did it. It just happened. Mm -hmm. It would never have happened if I were president. Do not make matters worth with the pipeline blow up. Hmm. Be strategic, comma, be smart, in parentheses, brilliant exclamation point. Get a negotiated deal done now, all in caps. Both sides need, both sides need and want it. The entire world, capitalized, is at stake. I will head up group, triple question mark. It, he can't stand anything that isn't about him. And I think, you know, although I, there's a part of me, and, I, and this, you know, gets back to the unseriousness problem. I'm sure there are already people on social media or Facebook or Twitter or wherever saying, see, he's Putin's puppet. Putin wrote that tweet. First of all, Putin would do a much better job. Putin's goons would write a better tweet than that. This is him saying, um, I, I never understood anything about this stuff. I don't know what I'm talking about. I am emotionally disturbed and I want this to somehow be about me. Let's talk about the, the Nord Stream pipeline. There's a lot of speculation about whether or not uh, it was sabotaged. I think that more rational folks, and you push back if you disagree with me, if in fact there was sabotage, it, it was most likely Russia uh, trying to uh, punish Europe or its support of Ukraine. But there are other theories out there. And since we've been talking about clowns with flamethrowers, here's your daily dose of Tucker Carlson giving this weird Orwellian Putin spins suggesting it might have been. Well, I'm just going to play it and get your reaction, Tom. This is this is Tucker Carlson's deep thoughts about the potential sabotage of the Nord Stream pipeline. Action has a reaction equal and opposite. Blow up the Nord Stream pipelines. OK, we've entered a new phase, one in which the United States is directly at war with the largest nuclear power in the world. What, doesn't mean it'll go nuclear immediately, but it does suggest huh? there could be consequences. If we actually blew up the Nord Stream pipelines, what? why wouldn't Russia sever undersea internet cables? What would happen if they did that? What would happen if banks in London couldn't communicate with banks in New York? Just that one piece of it, leaving aside its potential effects on our power grid. But let's just say the banks couldn't communicate with each other for one day. What would the economic effect of that be? Oh, we would cascade downward into your house. We could have an actual collapse. We could wind up very quickly in third world conditions. Those oh, are the for stakes. For God's sake. Yeah. Have the people behind this, the geniuses like Toria Newland, considered the effects? What? Maybe they have. Maybe that was the point. <laughs> what the? I'm. You know, <laughs> I know. Okay. It's it's mad. Well, first of all, it's it's, um, it's madness. <laughs> it's mad libs. Yeah. Um, you know has insert name of some Clinton official here, you know, or some Obama appointee here. Um, but, uh, you know, first of all, it, 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 when we get back to this problem of lack of seriousness, this is Tucker saying, hey, this is like a big game of risk. If, if they take Yakutsk, you know, we could take, uh, you know, lower U.S. and blue pieces of red. He has, first, he has no idea what he's talking about. The, the intern, you know, from some right wing publication probably wrote that monologue, has no idea what they're talking about. And I will I hate to ever in, engage on the substance of an argument like that. But if all of the undersea Internet, internet cables were cut and banks couldn't talk to each other, the, one of the first countries that would go under would be Russia and also China. Um, so, you know, aside, aside from the fact that, you know, the, that it's a bad, that it's a dumb idea in what, what, 
Tucker suggesting would actually, you know, hurt the, uh, the people that would do it. But, but again, he's playing the game, Charlie. Hey, here's an idea. So this thing happened in the news. How do I spin this to make this about yet another, you know, cortisol it, it releasing, you know, fear tirade uh, for an hour on television to my audience that doesn't understand Nord Stream. Oh, first of all, can we just mention that there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that we had anything to do with this whatsoever, yeah. that it would be crazy? I guess I am old enough to remember when Jean Kirkpatrick launched herself into prominence among conservatives by taking on the blame America first crowd. Remember, that used to be the yes. mantra, you lefties blame America first. That is literally now the Tucker Carlson playbook. Blame America first. There's a pipeline that blew up or had some sort of an accident. So what should we go immediately? I'm going to go on Fox News and tell my millions of followers, listeners, viewers that, you know, we should blame America first. You want to talk about how the world is turned upside down. You know, as recently as a couple of years ago, the you know, Wall Street Journal was editorializing the left still blames America first all the time. This is what they do. No, it is now the right that blames America first. And in even a crazier way, and I, you know, Kirkpatrick is one of the many people I miss. I knew, um, I will just say, I had a personal, there's a personal dimension to this. I was her assistant at Georgetown. Um, she Ooh. is the person who got me my job in the Senate. I am impressed. Um, I am when I worked for impressed. John, John Hines, um, mm -hmm. she blurbed one of my books back when I was a young professor just starting out. And I remember that. In fact, I had a volume. I still, probably still have it around the house somewhere um, of the 1984 Republican convention with her speech in it about blaming America first. But this is even crazier than that. This is not just, let me, you know, extend a tiny olive branch to our friends over on the left and say, they had this notion, wrong as it was, that America was this baleful influence on international affairs, that we were too big, we were trying to, you know, run the world because um, we were threatened by anybody that wasn't a capitalist. Uh, there was a certain coherence. I mean, it was, it was a I think I was wrong, but there was a coherence to their anti-Americanism about America's role in the world. This is, uh-oh, something happened and Russia's involved. Therefore, I must get on the side uh, against the Americans and on the same side as the Russians. Because P Tucker has made that clear. You know, why shouldn't I be for the Russians? In fact, I am. Well, then, you know, if once you've already made it clear where you stand on this stuff, um, your opinion about who, you know, who could have been responsible for this, this Nord Stream issue, you know, you've already kind of made an a priori decision about whose fault you think everything is. I guess what I'm saying is it's, it's beyond just an ideal. It's not even an ideological conviction. It's a reflexive he reminds me of um, Vladimir Posner. Do you remember? Are you old enough? You and I are both oh, old enough. Man, remember this guy, Vladimir Posner? Yeah. He was this really well-spoken. He'd been raised in America. He spoke fluent, unaccented English. He was kind of the Kremlin's man over here, mm -hmm. you know, and he could make these very um, elaborate, very elegant arguments for why everything was America's fault. Nothing was the Kremlin's fault. And again, it wasn't really an ideological position. It was just in instantly opposing anything America did and instantly supporting anything Russia did or the Soviet Union did. And that's kind of where these guys are now. You know, there's, there's just this kind of reflexive, no. um, you know, Russia is white Christian, gay people, uh, and hates gay yeah. people, mm -hmm. you know, um, and we're the decadent power. So I'm going to have to support the, the chesty cross wearing macho dictator, which, boy, when you talk about juvenile performativeness, that issue with Putin is uh, there's a whole other world of stuff going on there. But that's I think that's what it's about. I don't think it's even that well thought out. So we're at an ironic moment here where we were talking about uh, fascists and semi-fascists. And we have a new uh, prime minister in Italy who, you know, heads up a party that was, is really the successor to Mussolini's fascist party. And yet the American right, people like Tucker Carlson are actually further to the right than she is. They are further yes. to the right she, than the She than actually the supports Western exactly. foreign policy. Exactly. <laughs> she actually supports Ukraine <laughs> and is Putin skeptical, shall we say, unlike some of her coalition partners. So yeah, it's, it's like Tucker Carlson's going, uh, you know, fascism in Italy. I can do one better than that. I can, I can go further than all of that. And yet there are conservatives who have immediately 
their knee has jerked say, well, why does anybody think she's she has anything to do with fascism? Well, I don't know, because she picked up the symbol of the fascist party and put it on her flag. Um, <laughs> she's she's you know, praised Mussolini for always she's being praised Mussolini. Italy. She talks yeah. about, you know, international financiers and how they're ruining the world. But but as you said, you know, even with all that, wait, we can still get further to her right than she is. All right, let's talk about Vladimir Putin. Um, you had an interesting take on somebody was asking about these uh, these sham referendums and they're coming back, what, 98, 99% of the vote saying, absolutely, we want to be part of Russia. And somebody said, well, why would you go for that? Why wouldn't you just, you know, why do you have to, why don't you have something realistic, like, you know, 69% or 70%? Um, why is Vladimir Putin, you know, faced with all the criticism that's just say a sham election, why is he pushing it right to the edge and saying, yeah, it's 99 fucking percent? What's that about? All right. Well, because in a situation like this, the goal is not to, I mean, the, the veneer of legitimacy is far less important than trying to convince your opponents that you are invulnerable, that you are already in charge, that opposing them is pointless. Yeah. Uh, and so this is a, this is a result that says we've taken this territory. It's done. It's over. And oh, a referendum? You won't you think we should have a referendum? Fine. Fuck you. Here's yeah. your referendum. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, they're not sitting around going, how can how can we um make it look more legitimate? How can we convince the world this is legitimate? No, there's none of that going on here. There's none of that. This is a signal to the rest of the world that this is a fait accompli and that they are completely in charge. All right. So most important question of the day, which I have saved for last now. Uh, we are getting these threats of the use of nuclear weapons out of Russia. As things have gone from bad to worse, as the mobilization, by the way, what a shambolic mess that is. I, just, I, find, oh these, God, I, yeah. find, I find these pictures out of Russia to be truly amazing, just people just like leaving the country. And as you point out, I mean, they are just, they're throwing cannon fodder, you know, right onto the front lines right now. It's going to be a real meat grinder. So what are they left with? They're left with these threats of using nukes. And we have uh, the former uh, president, Medvedev, you know, suggesting this is not a bluff. We are prepared to do this. This is the point of the referendums, right? To make it Russian territory so that right. these military operations are an attack on the motherland, you know, on Russian soil, which therefore they would say justifies our use of nukes. How seriously should we take that threat? We should always take those threats seriously, but but things you take seriously, you do not treat as as likely or imminent either. And this is goes back to what we started this conversation with about somewhere between shrugging your shoulders and having your hair on fire. Um, I have wondered, and I have no you know other than just kind of my gut instinct as a Russia watcher for a long time. I even wonder if part of the the goal here is to send those guys to Eastern Ukraine so that they die. So that literally their blood soaks into the ground. And then Putin says, you see, this is now Russia. The bodies of thousands of Russian boys, um, you know, are soaked into this into this dirt. And therefore, we can never leave it. Literally um, sunken costs. This literally, literally sunk, right. sunken I mean, costs, yeah. By the way, there are cases in history where leaders have done this. I mean, Bismarck's mm -hmm. attack on a fortress um, you know, in the Danish war, you know, when his commander said, this is completely hopeless, a lot of guys are going to die. And he went, right, that's exactly, that gives us a, that gives us a place at the table. All those bodies give us a place at the table. Um, Oof. and yeah, it was the, the it's the fortress of Dupal. Um, and so, uh, you know, it could be that Putin is doing something like that. The, the question is whether or not he gets, things get so unstable in Russia that he decides that the only way to, to scramble the deck, the only way to get a do over and to, you know, kind of bring everything to a halt is to use a small nuclear weapon. Maybe, you know, I used to say, well, maybe he blows one up out at sea to show how he's so serious he is, or that he blows one up somewhere in Eastern Ukraine to say this was to forestall an unacceptable invasion of the motherland. Now, the, I still think that's highly unlikely because I think even the craziest people in the Kremlin know that they're going to get calls from people like China and others who are going to say, you know, to use mob terminology that Putin would understand. Now I got to turn my back on you. Now I got to walk away from you. And as I said yesterday in the Atlantic, I think that ends his regime faster than losing this war does. So I still think it's unlikely. And I still wonder if there are people, you know, in the Russian military are going to say, 
some of our people are there. Some of this is going to blow into our country. You really, you know, this is, is this really an order I'm going to follow? But there are also people in the Russian military who are saying we are so humiliated that we'll do anything now ourselves too. Uh, this is a bad, this is bad voodoo all around and it's really dangerous. So it is really dangerous. And, and we know what cornered animals will sometimes do. What is happening with public opinion in Russia? I mean, up until now, if you believe any of the polls, which I think we should be skeptical about, but it would indicate that the most Russians have supported what's going on. But, you know, that's, of course, before you have this mass mobilization um, and then sending untrained soldiers to the, the, the front line. So and does public opinion matter, I guess? So does it change public opinion? And then does it matter? It does, because, you know, part of what dictators want is peace and quiet. And when you're getting, you know, military recruitment offices, getting Molotov cocktails thrown into them, um, that's a big deal. The other, there's a couple of things that aren't quite obvious to Westerners. One is that he's, he, at first he tried to do this by dragooning kids from the boondocks. The problem is the boondocks is where he's most popular. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and all those kids have cell phones uh, or smartphones rather. And there, you know, things are starting to come out and people are seeing what's happening for, for people who don't understand how this is done, you know, here in the United States, right. If we draft you, um, or if we pull you into the Navy or the army, we sent you to great lakes, we sent you to, you know, Fort Benning or, you know, wherever, and you kind of train with everybody here, this would be like saying, You've been drafted. Report to the 10th Mountain guys up at Fort Drum in New York, and uh, they'll tell you what to do next, and they'll get you clothed. I mean, there's no central way of doing this. So you have all these, this, as you said, this sh kind of shambolic mess. But of course, in, there are now smartphones. Putin seems to forget this isn't 1975. People are taking videos of this, and it's traveling all across the, the, the Russian Federation. So I think it does matter because his social compact with the Russian people was to say, this is going to be a splendid little war. We're going to have big parades. Everything's going to be awesome, and it won't touch you. Peter Pomerantsev had a great line. He said, this was supposed to be a TV show. Now it's touching Russians. And the deal Putin always had was the old Soviet deal. You leave us alone, we leave you alone. You leave the people in power alone, we leave you alone to live your lives. Well, when you start dragooning people, I mean, this isn't even a draft. This is literally like dragooning people and pulling them in and saying, you know, go go show up over there and get a uniform. Um, you know, that that breaks that deal. And then when things become unstable, I always say dictators seem completely invulnerable right up until the day they're not. Yeah, right on, but until uh, Ceausescu goes out onto the balcony. You know, um, General Mark Hurtling has been writing and talking about this a lot. He talks about, you know, how much training an American soldier gets, how detailed, how long it takes, and then contrasts it with the really uh, shitty training that we've seen in, in the Russian army. This seems like it's it's becoming even shittier. And I guess, uh, let me ask you this question because you're a lot more knowledgeable about it. It strikes me that there was at one time, I suppose, an era where you could take an untrained soldier and hand him a, a, a rifle and just, you know, put him in a trench and then say, go over the trench and just, you know, you know, you know, go and shoot at the enemy. That's no longer the case in, in warfare any longer. And that the modern soldier needs to be much more sophisticated and well-trained. And so Russia is going in exactly the wrong direction at the wrong moment. I would say that it, that notion of, you know, dragging a guy, uh, you know, in and handing him a rifle and pointing him at the enemy, that that probably hasn't been the way that successful militaries work since maybe at least the 1870s, mm -hmm. um, at least since the, the mid 20th century. But the Ru here's the, the reason the Russians think it works that way, or at least some Russians like Putin, because their experience of doing that is when they've been invaded. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you've got the Wehrmacht coming at you, um, and I, I highly recommend the movie Enemy at the Gates, because that's where a lot of people are pulling these memes from and other scenes um, about, the, about the defense of Stalingrad. Yeah, if you're defending Stalingrad, sure, hand a guy a rifle and say, listen, just kill anybody that's not us. And, <laughs> and you know, good luck. And, and the guy behind you, you know, you don't really have a rifle, but he's going to get shot and die. So pick his up and then, once again, kill anybody that's not us. Kill, you know, kill Germans. There's a, a patriotic poster from World War II, a Soviet patriotic poster that says, one bullet, one German. 
Mm. You know, and it's got it's got a kid, a fresh faced kid holding a rifle, one bullet, one German. And that doesn't work anymore because Russia is not being invaded. The Wehrmacht is not rolling over the planes toward Moscow. And you can't just hand guys a rifle and say, you know, save your motherland. And I suspect that even the defense minister, who has no military experience, by the way, doesn't understand that. I suspect that guys that served in Afghanistan and other places get it. Because to fight effectively, not only do you have to have some knowledge of, you know, basics about military, and I I have never served in the military. I spent 25 years teaching military officers about strategy and policy. Um, You do have to form some kind of shared identity. And General Hurtling talks about this a lot. The training together over time is what forges a bunch of, you know, ragtag bunch of guys into a fighting unit. And the Russians aren't doing that. They think this is, they're trying to recreate the sense of 1943, you know, 19, the winter Mm -hmm. of 42. Here's your rifle. The enemy's over there. Go do your duty for the motherland. Well, you know, that's just a recipe for getting your ass kicked and for having massive desertions for people that don't understand why they're doing this. There was, and I'll just, there was one more, more thing I want to add to this. Is there was a um, some film of this on one of the networks and this this Russian woman yelling, Zashto, you know, she's yelling, for what? Yeah. Like you're pulling my son, for what? And that, no one in 1942 no one after June of 1941 in the Soviet Union ever said, for what? They knew for what. But Putin doesn't understand is that there are millions of Russians looking around and going, you, I'm do, you're going to do that? And for what? You're, what? What are we doing here? What is the point of this? Tom Nichols, staff writer at The Atlantic and professor emeritus at the Naval War College. And his books include, as you know, The Death of Expertise and Our Own Worst Enemy. We always love having you on the podcast. Thanks for coming back today. I appreciate it very much. Thanks, Charlie. The Bulwark Podcast is produced by Katie Cooper with audio production by Jonathan Siri. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast. And we'll be back tomorrow to do this all over again.